Welcome. We are excited to have you joining us today for a webinar where we will be focusing on pediatrics and the exciting work happening to advance population health and value-based care. The Innovacer network of customers is deeply involved in this space, recognizing how many of the people in the United States are affected by their journey as pedi pediatric patients and parents of pediatric patients, grandparents, and certainly businesses and entities that are working to improve the care, both socially, clinically, and in much broader ways from behavioral health as well as thinking of it from a business model of how we advance value-based care in this space. We are pleased today to dig deeper into some of the key topics that are really hot in PEDS um, because of how much impact they have, both in terms of clinical care and what's happening with our workforce providing care, as well as the business leaders who are seeking to make these new forms of value work uh, for the entire community. You'll hear our customers here today talking about topics such as um, the ability to handle behavioral health differently, the ability to work on ED utilization. How do we approach contracting differently now that we have technology and data and workflows that can support it? And certainly something that has been so central to PEDS all along, which are the social aspects of providing care in a more complete and total way. One of the reasons we like uh, this topic is because pediatrics has in many ways been a forerunner. Much of value-based care has in fact evolved out of the pediatric space as they are a population. And when you think of the term population health and how do you look at a macro level across a set of individuals, PEDS has been a defining way to do that. So as we listen, we're going to hear experts who have in fact been part of the journey to get us here. I'm going to introduce our three panelists today. We have from Nemours, Alex Koster. We have from Mercy Children's, Michelle Manaski and Luke Harris. They'll each be introducing themselves and giving you an interesting little factoid about something um, that might make you remember them for a lot longer than just this presentation. I'm going to go ahead and start with Alex. Hello, I'm Alex Koster with Nemours Children's Health. I'm the Senior Director of Analytics and Technology for our Value-Based Services Organization. Um, basically, my job is to um, implement uh, the technology and analytics infrastructure for population health, social determinants of health, and our value-based care contracting in um, all of our markets. And that includes everything from claims data ingestion to um, research and scholarly projects around a population. I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you. That's as far as great. a factoid about me, I love paddleboarding and used to go with my son a lot until we went to an inlet and the sun was perfect that day and we got to see exactly how many giant stingray were underneath us. And just as my son was panicking a little bit as we crossed the inlet, I said, what? Come on, we've seen the worst there is. What else could there possibly be here to worry you, son? And that's when the shark fin went by right in front of us. So um, <laughs> I have never seen anyone paddle a paddleboard that fast to get out of the water. Um, and we really don't go together anymore. But we had well, a great that, time that day anyway. That would be memorable. And it's always good to have father-son bonding moments, right? Uh, and memories that last a lifetime. Okay, Michelle. That was definitely gonna... memorable. <laughs> I can see why. Michelle, I'd uh, love to hear what you are engaged with in your organization. Yeah, I'm Michelle Manaski. I'm the Assistant Director of Operations and Population Health Management at Children's Mercy. And I oversee our social determinants of health strategy, as well as a number of other quality improvement and cost improvement initiatives, um, including all of our, our Innovacer work. Um, and a fun fact about me, I love sports. I grew up playing and watching a lot of sports. I um, played uh, collegiate softball. Um, and now that I'm getting older, I, I can't quite play fast pitch softball anymore. So I've taken up golfing with my husband. And so we have a, we have a two-year-old and a, one on the way. So it's not often that we have the free time to go golfing together anymore. But when we do, we, uh, we really enjoy having some friendly, friendly-ish competition on the golf course. Uh, there we go. I sense some mini golf in your future with little ones. 
Yeah. Great to have you with us today. And Luke, we'd love to hear a little bit about you. Hello, uh, and thanks for having me. I'm Luke Harris, and I'm Senior Director of Operations and Population Health Management for Children's Mercy Kansas City. Uh, in my role, help lead and support the strategy and the operations of our value-based care work that's built in partnership with nearly 40 community pediatric practices, as well as our over 750 specialists. And really, you know, when you step back and, you know, our collective role in our team is how do we optimize our performance, both from a cost and quality perspective in our value-based agreements, and we also oversee uh, really the operate how we operationalize the technology and optimize its use with our practices and our specialists. Oh, and then my my fact, uh, interesting fact about me. So I am an avid downhill skier and not just uh, any downhill skier. I actually grew up as a freestyle skier and that's mm -hmm. a, a skier that basically do tricks. So I do spins or go on rails or do some inverted flips. I grew up in the Midwest. It was one of these things. They don't have any mountains in the Midwest. And, you know, to kind of keep pushing myself and trying to improve, it's just something that I got into and uh, really enjoy. Well, this is your season um, yes. here in the in the winter time and start of the year as people are viewing this. So we're glad to have everyone here today. We will go ahead and get started on the, the meat of the presentation, what all of our listeners are here for. We'll start with Alex uh, teeing us up. And we've organized this in a way because we thought it would be really interesting for our listeners to think about the big picture of the contracts that set the tone in many cases and drive the framework of how the business proceeds with the care inside of it. Alex? As I mentioned, I work for Nemours Children's Health. We are a large multi-state pediatric health system with freestanding children's hospitals in Wilmington, Delaware, and Orlando, Florida. We have um, over 70 um, different care locations and um, really work out of the Delaware Valley, that is Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and then Florida. So we have a big hub in Central Florida. Our corporate office is in Jacksonville. Uh, we have presence in Pensacola and then in the Delaware Valley. Our health system is very much focused on population health and advocacy for children. We have a national office that focuses on health advocacy at the national and state level. Uh, we have the Kids Health website, which is kind of the largest provider of educational content around uh, pediatric health um, in the world. And we um, are very much invested in what we call well beyond medicine with all of its meetings, uh, the well being of children outside of medicine or even transcending the medical to promote well being and bring about the healthiest generation of children. For 2023 and 24, we're several years into our value-based care journey and our journey taking on uh, risk or focusing on uh, shared savings or, or pretty um, complex uh, pay for performance contracts with quality. The areas of focus um, for this year and into next where we are continue along our journey involve improving our risk adjustment processes, our capture of chronic diseases, reducing our avoidable ED visits, and then um, kind of optimizing our workflows and systems and processes for our medical management department, including a focus on chronic disease management, um, monitoring and, and managing our high cost patients, and then engaging in medication management and pharmacy support for our value-based care contracts. These priorities really inform everything from how we're staffed and resourced, who we're hiring, uh, what skills we're developing, um, and education to where we're focusing our workflow efforts um, our technology build within our EHR, within Innovacer as well, our analytics development, and um, even how we prioritize conversations with areas such as privacy and compliance and information security. They're all kind of informed by these, these priorities. From an analytics perspective, we, we follow what I call kind of a parallel strategy uh, between taking advantage of claims-based data, um, paid claims from payers tied to the rosters that we receive from those payers, the frameworks that um, are familiar from a contracting perspective to engage in a lot of the, the measures that are really at the core of value-based contract. So um, the PMPMs, the um, inpatient rates, ED rates, and, and things like that. Our claims-based data strategy uh, primarily uses Innovacer, um, InGraph as our 
um, analytics platform. And, and it really is the most comprehensive source. We're, we're seeing what the payers see. We're calculating, um, hopefully, what the payers calculate. But it does have limitations. Claim-based data has, has a huge lag. So where it's comprehensive in settings of care, there's, there's a lag to it. And um, so you're looking a little bit at a lot of insight that is a little bit historical. We also um, have a parallel strategy, which is what I'm going to call our EHR-based data. We are um, on a single instance of our EMR across all of our dozens of locations. We um, ingest data from our clinically integrated network partners, even though they're on, on nine different EMRs. Um, we do have some exchange there as well. Um, that data is not as complete from a value contract perspective, but it actually enriches the conversation with clinical data that doesn't exist in the form of claims, so things like lab values and um, in other encounter information uh, that may not uh, be reflected in, in paid billing. Um, it also allows us for some of our patients to have um, a better longitudinal view. So where we have uh, patients that move between Medicaid payers and move between commercial and Medicaid uh, payers, we may have some history in our um, EHR that predates the, that member um, belonging to that contract. So let's say they were on a Medicaid contract the prior year. We have some clinical history with them. Right now on the value contract, they're in a commercial, if they're on a commercial value contract. We may have some history um, that predates them uh, joining that commercial payer and belonging to that contract. In addition, we use other um, sources of information for very uh, more targeted functions, um, health information um, exchange alerts and counter notification, what we call ENS. Um, we make uh, huge use of those um, across uh, three different states. We use um, 3M's clinical risk grouper as our kind of clinical uh, risk stratification tool. And we also uh, make extensive use of other payer reports like quality reports, um, for different quality measures that we reconcile, different types of rosters like uh, care coordination rosters and, and things like that that may not be what we load directly in with our claims, but they give us different insights. In terms of um, our first area of focus, which is our, our risk strat and risk adjustment strategy, we um, really have focused a lot on building out the capabilities uh, within our um, Innovator platform to be able to look at not only the clinic level, but also providers, and that's, that's the first diagram. Look at our recapture rates, make sure that the uh, number of attributed lives and the weighting um, help guide our priorities, and also make sure that the average risk makes sense. So uh, within our specific um, health system and, and clinically integrated network, we have certain departments and providers that focus on medically complex children, and we have others that are more traditional community practices. And so we want to make sure that our average risk, even at those higher levels, that they pass a sniff test. We're, we're seeing that complexity reflected in, in the overall scores um, at a first glance uh, because we are here looking at what the payers will ultimately see. The risk capture, recapture rate trend is something we monitor closely, particularly as we engage in interventions. Even though this has a big of a lag, we want to parallel this data with what we see through our EHR, where we have alerts and prompts that are integrated in the clinical workflow uh, driving for recapture. And so as we conduct education or roll out that functionality, a couple of months later, we should see the increases coming through the claims data. And um, that's something we're going to be focusing a lot more on in the coming year. And um, also looking at wh where are our gaps coming from. And, and so this diagram, on this chart on the right is one of my favorites. It's really looking at, do we have a problem with missed codes or missed patients? And making sure we have the ability to analyze each separately because the way we will conduct interventions um, around those two is, is very, very different. If, if we see, that our, our predominant gaps involve patients we have not seen that are high risk, that's definitely engagement from our care coordination and care management teams versus cases where if we've seen the patient multiple times but we're still not capturing a chronic disease or resolving it, we may need to do some coding education or understand what the barriers are. We also invented a, kind of a new um, analytics model to look at our missed codes. Uh, which is using a, a, a tree map, which speaks volumes. The, the size of the box 
has to um, ties directly into the number of children that are missing a specific uh, CDPS or HCC grouper. And then the, the darkness of the color is the relative weight. So if we see a large box that is shaded darker, we know that is both uh, a heavy opportunity in terms of a number of patients that are um, missing codes, but also the, the weight impact that that will have on our overall um, population risk score. So, so heavier, heavier uh, risk adjustment factor involved. So you can see an example where we have asthma except severe. We have a lot of children missing it, but the relative weight at point one uh, six is not very high. But then at the bottom, we have a small box where it's only five children, but the relative weight of that hemo hematological very high is, is 18.9. Um, and so that, that's an area, well, it's five children. We have to understand, are they lost to care? Is there a reason we haven't seen them in the year that we haven't captured that code and it's gonna have a tremendous impact overall uh, to get those uh, diagnosis added? Uh, we also use um, InNote, which is a point of care tool that presents uh, gaps in coding as well as uh, recent acute um, inpatient ER uh, visits. Um, InNote is very well suited to provide us a standard platform across multiple EHRs because it is agnostic and it allows um, the presentation of those uh, coding gaps to our community practices that use a variety of different systems. Um, we also take advantage of our embedded EHR capabilities for prompting uh, for coding gaps. So in the next six months, we'll really be working on uh, monitoring the, the deployment, how well we're closing the gaps, how well the providers are taking advantage of those systems and acknowledging that they would be adding um, the various missing codes. I will note um, these models do support, again, CDPS and HHS, HCC and pediatrics. Those are the two dominant models that, that apply to us. Our next area was avoidable ER visits. Um, here I, I actually said it's not just a parallel approach, it's actually three part from a data perspective where we look at claims data um, to look at avoidable ED visits across facilities uh, using the New York algorithm and, and other types of analysis to look at practice and provider patterns, um, look at seasonal patterns as well, uh, which were huge last year, and also uh, look at cost impact of things like avoidable ED visits. Then um, we look at our EHR data uh, within our hospitals to see, are we seeing patterns when, when we expand the population maybe beyond a single value contract? What are we seeing seasonally? What are we seeing in terms of capacity? And um, we'll show you a little bit more how we, we looked at things like a nurse triage um, dispositions and, and how are they uh, shedding light on why patients may be coming to our IDs. And then we also look at um, the ESI level uh, that uh, of um, ED visits that are coming to our emergency department. In addition to this, we make extensive use of health information exchange and counter notification data, both integrated into our EHR and in um, their own analytics and served up for our community practices um, as, as flat files. The benefit of that data is that it is near real time. Um, you, you get information almost immediately about uh, ED visits that happen at any um, hospital within uh, your market. Uh, that provides a great advantage if you're doing a care coordination follow-up or you um, are gonna follow up on an inpatient admission. The downside is ENS data tends to be um, the least robust in terms of uh, supporting an analytics framework. It doesn't necessarily have the richness of all the diagnostic data you might want. And partly that's because it's coming at that point. There hasn't been a coding review. There hasn't been a charge dropped yet and a claim that has been coded. And so you kind of get whatever um, a diagnosis or, or reason for that uh, emergency department visit is available at the time it happens or reason, uh, suspected reason for that inpatient admission at, at at the time it takes place. And so it is very useful for follow-up, not as robust for, um, for a robust, stable analysis over time. Our care coordinators really live off of this model and we also have it going directly into our AHR to feed um, utilization metrics and, and predictive models. Some sample analysis um, out of Innovacer, we can see our ED visit breakdowns, our percent avoidable over time compared to our overall ED rates and our patterns of avoidable diagnosis. This is truly um, fascinating to see and, and very much uh, provides us context, um, a bit retrospectively, but important context. So during the triple-demic, 
um, we, we experienced both in our own hospitals and in the data at other hospitals, that giant spike in flu-related ED visits. And we were able to then look at what, what we knew about the vaccination rate of those populations. And um, anyone in pediatric knows that the, the vaccination rate um, for flu vaccine has really plummeted in the last few years uh, for a variety of reasons. And we saw not only that huge drop, we also saw uh, that most of the children that came to our ED um, in the fourth quarter of last year were unvaccinated. And so it, it allows a slightly different conversation um, as we meet with families. We can inform the primary care, the medical home conversations with families, encouraging them to vaccinate this year. Um, the key also in the breakdown um, between um, emergent primary care treatable, non-emergent and emergent uh, preventable is that each informs a very different strategy of intervention. So misutilization of the ED, or what uh, might be um, grouped as lane, low acuity, non-emergent, is handled very, very different than, uh, than preventable uh, chronic disease uh, deterioration. And so having a sense of what, what is it we're trying to do, what, what, what impact should we see uh, based on each intervention is, is, is really important. And so this allows us to hone in on different, um, different areas and different types of interventions. It also gives us a, a framework where we switch from looking at that payer claims data into our own hospital analytics. We're able to carry some of the same concepts, such as the New York algorithm you see on the right, but also look at patterns within our ESI, um, look at percent of patients that we actually admitted, what time of day they're coming, what day of week, our own internal data for utilization, and, and our volumes. And so this data is much more timely than the claims data, but we're only looking at our own hospitals. So we can limit it to that same population that falls under our value contracts, but to, a, um, to our hospital, we have all that depth of clinical content and the ability to see, were those patients calling primary care first? And, and one of the insights we gained during the, the, the big uh, disease uh, triple-demic last year with uh, RSV and flu, et cetera, was it wasn't just that families were choosing to go to the ED for things that NYU, um, uh, the algorithm says are non-emergent, is that primary care was actually sending them there because we did not have the sick visit capacity because they were so overwhelmed. And so that's a different kind of intervention where we're actually looking at, well, what happens to a value contract and your avoidable volume if your own system is routing patients to the ED. We may not have the urgent care access we want. Are we taking advantage of telehealth urgent care enough? Or are we just automatically saying, here, use one of these options, we can't see you. And so this is informing scripting and actions as we look at 2023 and, and beyond. Um, really focusing on, on building out our models for medical management. Our medical management team is a single integrated service that crosses between our hospitals all the way to our community practices. Uh, with complex care management, care coordination, and patient case management. Uh, most recently, we are expanding our community health work teams. We've added pharmacy and community education, and, and we already referenced CDI looking at, at that risk capture. So um, we're using our, our claims-based analytic within the tool. We're feeding data from our EHR and other sources into um, Innovator to look at um, our care management status, to look at our clinical risk grouper, and actually look at our spend by category, length of, length of stay, are we dealing with high pharmacy cost patients, are we dealing with high inpatient costs, et, et cetera. Make sure that all of these patients are getting um, put into or at least offered a care management program, is there a care coordinator doing outreach, et cetera and um, then expanding our use of pharmacy analytics to support our value-based care uh, pharmacy team, looking at patterns of prescription, fulfillment, how many days are, are they getting prescribed? Are we um, really focusing on uh, the right mix of generic and brand? Are we um, finding any payer obstacles or any other obstacles that would benefit from targeted outreach? Um, really focusing on uh, AMR here and asthma management as part of a coordinated effort that not only drives um, some of the, the drug costs, but also ties directly into some of that avoidable um, emergency department volume, avoidable inpatient um, volume, and, and really um, a lot of uh, burden on our children that 
really ought to be in school. They're missing school. They're ending up in hospitals. They're getting uh, sick with other conditions. And so asthma is definitely an area we're going to be focusing a lot and a priority for our medication management team. Uh, finally, uh, we, we're really working on, on looking at uh, avoidable costs around our prescriptions to see if that's an area we can focus on. It's probably not as big a lever as it is in some um, adult areas. Uh, but it is, um, you know, we'll take any dollar we can, we can save without uh, patient impact. And it also helps when we have to have conversations with payers. They tend to come to us often. Uh, human growth hormone comes up all the time. It's very high cost. It's prescribed by specialists. And, and we, we end up, you know, having conversations around it or around um, uh, drugs that, where the generic may not be available on the market or the preferred um, uh, Medication simply isn't available, and we work with our payers to talk about alternatives. So all in all, that's, that's where we are right now. I'm happy to take a few questions, and thank you for the time. That's great. Really appreciate this comprehensive overview, Alex, and I know it is only a mere corner of the amount of work that you're engaged with there. You know, Luke or Michelle, as you see one of your peers present things that I'm sure you also wrestle with, Anything that, that kind of struck you as, um, you know, an, a new observation or made you think differently about even your own work or, or ways that you've addressed it as well? Uh, yeah, you know, one area in particular is around risk capture and just risk coding. So this is an area that we've done a fair amount of education really around capturing uh, the relevant diagnostics for patients. But I really liked how you visually, you know, identify these opportunities, both from a the, you know, the volume or size as well as the acuity. Yeah, so the question I have is around uh, risk capture. So, you know, we've we've had kind of mixed success in this. We've really kind of focused on how do we engage our providers and make sure that they're capturing all of the diagnostic codes that are relevant, you know, for the chronic uh, conditions that they're managing. And so the question is, you know, have you focused both from a pr primary care perspective as well as a, a specialty care perspective and wanted to just know, um, you know, how, how do you approach that? So right now we are starting with primary care. We have in our roadmap for next year really to, to broach um, specialty care a little bit more. Uh, one of my goals is, is not only to bring about the tools and make sure that we understand what they're showing and not showing, but also make sure that we have succinct but effective messaging as to why this matters. And uh, we are working on uh, not only some simple talking points around how risk adjustment um, impacts uh, contractual performance, particularly in um, uh, commercial contracts where the risk adjustment is this factor that applies no matter how well you think you did, that multiplier at the end can really uh, dictate success, but also how it informs uh, Medicaid, Medicaid funding, MLR, things like that. And so we are working with um, our payers and um, our state um, government relations offices to really make sure we understand exactly how that works in each of our states so that we can speak to our providers and explain this, these are all of the implications of this process. So we're going to try and align it, align it in terms of accountability and individual training, but also in terms of um, raising awareness about how this connects to our, our care, um, resourcing that, that patients may receive, and, and also our own cycle directly. Fantastic. Great. That's, thanks. thanks for sharing. I like that you're going up the food chain, you know, so you're thinking structural as well as going down into what providers themselves can do. I think that's going to, you know, give a more complete picture so we don't end up with these piecemealed solutions like we often see with unintended consequences. Michelle, anything that, that you wanted to, you know, point out here? Yeah, I, I was really interested in your avoidable ED analytics. Um, that's a hot topic for us as well. And we leverage the NYU algorithm. Um, we are mostly focused on the non-emergent preventable category. Um, and I think we've done some some great work where we've been able to improve those rates a little bit. But, you know, um, I think struggling to really make a large impact in that space. Do you have any advice about where you think you've been able to to have the most success in regards to avoidable ED? So um, part of it is really understanding the populations, right? It, um, we talk about avoidable ED and, and we really need to understand what are the alternatives of care available? 
Um, what we have as options with our technology savvy and our flexibility of jobs is very, very different from someone who works in, um, in a position they cannot leave. Uh, you know, they're at a, a Walmart or a Target or whatever. They're, they can only take their child somewhere after hours or they have transportation barriers. And really understanding, is there actually a, a viable alternative? And that's where that time of day analysis comes in, uh, day of week analysis comes in. And also looking and, and finding out, are you creating your own barriers? And that's where that nurse triage analysis comes in. Like what happened when they called primary care? How many of them came to primary care first? Because we, we may think that it's about um, driving behavior um, as consumers, but we may not realize how much influence our own health systems have on, in, on driving that behavior. And if the New York algorithm is saying you have a high level of activity that is non-emergent, but your nurse triage activity is showing that we're referring patients to the ED or to other high acuity settings like an urgent care frequently, the disconnect is within the system. It's not with the patient at all. And, and looking there, once it got down to consumer behavior, one, one intervention we had that was successful is we showed the high utilizer lists to our PCPs as part of a pilot a few years ago. And we said, you pick who you think you can intervene with. This is what we know about them. And we said, pick 25 children that are high ED utilizers and, or pick 20 out of these 50, you decide, because we can't tell clinically, we're not clinicians on our side, um, who really is not, not really impactable to that level. And we, we had tremendous success once we, we, we moved from that population thought process to a cohort. And we monitored that cohort. We found that once the physicians had a conversation about appropriate use with the cohort they identified, um, the rates of avoidable ED for those uh, patients dropped by about 80%. And, um, but the key was they chose because they know the patients rather than us coming in just with anonymous data or data that we don't recognize that individual child or family and saying, fix this. We, 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 we went through the effort of, of building the cohorts for each and saying, we're going to track the cohorts and then we're going to come back with that reinforcement of look at the impact you've had six months later. And so that's a process we are likely to revisit next year. We only did it as a pilot a few years ago. Now we have much better tools and data to really scale it. And we have a whole intervention team that can help um, see how well we can um, bring it to, to uh, a broader population. I think that scalability is one of the things that we're seeing, you know, technology is bringing where you uh, can move from individual studies, individual practices, you know, one-off interventions to something that can be automated and, and supported and, and even auto-triggered in a way that just couldn't happen before. It's also a great segue over to our, our folks here from Children's Mercy. We're going to start with Michelle and Luke, um, because part of what you brought up, Alex, is all of those conditions that impact care that are not directly medical um, and the broader context that, that your patients sit within. So for our listeners, uh, we're going to go ahead and start with Michelle. Thank you. So as um, we've talked about, Luke and I are both from Children's Mercy in Kansas City, where we are the only pediatric trauma center between St. Louis and Denver. You can see more about our organization on the screen here. But I did just want to highlight that in addition to our hospital and associated clinics, we also operate a pediatric ACO-like entity where we have at-risk capitated Medicaid enrollees and commercial enrollees that are in value-based payment models. And we operate this through our clinically integrated networks. And so um, as part of these networks, we work with our Children's Mercy Clinics. In addition, we also work with about 40 independently owned pediatric primary care clinics out in the community. And so ultimately, what this means is we're responsible for improving the quality of care and reducing the overall cost of care for over 250,000 children, which represents about 50% of all the kids that live in the Kansas City metro area. And I'm going to talk um, more about our work in addressing social determinants of health and how we've done that through building community partnerships and leveraging technology. And so we first started screening for social determinants of health in 2020, really because of our payer contracts and the requirements that were coming from them. Um, at the same time, we recognize it's the right thing to do. We know that when our patients' social needs are met, um, they have greater health potential, which then leads toward helping accomplish our population health management goals of lessening healthcare utilization and lowering cost. So we started screening um, within primary care in 2020, 
But the problem that we kept coming back to was what were we going to do when patients screened positive? Our practices that are in the community don't have many resources. Many of them, most of them, do not have social work support or community resource specialists. Um, so adding this addition to the workflow was a massive amount of work and something that our providers were very nervous and resistant to taking on. Um, and really, they weren't coming from a bad place. Um, we agreed that asking these questions of families, questions like, do you have enough food to feed your children? Or do you have a safe place to live? It's really unethical for us to ask those questions if we don't have the ability to help families when they're vulnerable enough to tell us their stories. So we knew that we needed to build out a more comprehensive social care approach that would be feasible for our clinics to implement. And so we started working with a company called Find Help in building out a social care referral platform. And we were able to brand it specific uh, to Children's Mercy, and we refer to it as, as Lift Up KC. And the value proposition of leveraging a tool like, like Lift Up KC that's powered by Find Help is that it not only provides us with a up-to-date resource list of all the nonprofit agencies or community-based organizations that are um, available to families to access, but it also allows us to submit referrals on behalf of patients and families directly to those community-based organizations. So when we have a family that comes in and tells us they have a need, if they want our help coordinating them to get help for that need, we can click a few buttons, send the referral through the technology where it then lands within the community-based organization's queue, where they then can reach out to the family and see if they're eligible and get them integrated into their, their services. The CBO can then uh, close the loop on that communication by telling us what happened with the referral. Were they able to help the family or not? And if not, they tell us why not. We're able to track all this data in the system so that then we can link it to health outcomes. And we also have a public facing website. So we know there's a subset of families that want our help in coordinating this, but there's also many families that don't want help because this is really sensitive and they wanna be able to access resources on their own in the privacy of their own space. And so we have a public site, which is liftupkc.org. Anybody can go to the website and look for resources on their own. And so we've integrated Lift Up KC directly into our clinical tools because we know that if providers have to log into a separate portal, they're, they're not going to leverage it. And so for our practices in the community that are all on different electronic medical records, we've integrated it into our Innovacera point of care tool, which is called InNote. And Alex talked a little bit about InNote earlier, but if you're not familiar with it, the way that it works is a provider will open the electronic medical record and then InNote will start to uh, look for that patient by reading the demographic information on the, the EHR. It then brings in all the data that we have on the, on the patient, which includes our full claims data and any clinical data. So it includes much more than what the practice has in their own individual EMR. It then brings all that data together in a matter of seconds, pops open, slides over a portion of the EMR and um, presents insights. So at Children's Mercy, this is what our InNote looks like. We're using it to display recommended care where we show any immunizations, screenings, uh, visits that the, the patient is in need of. We also show recent ED visits, urgent care visits, or inpatient admissions, uh, recent specialty visits where we also include the notes from that clinic visit that our providers don't have access to in their own EMR. And then finally, we've integrated Lift Up KC directly into InNote, where you see that social determinants of health section that's circled in blue. And so what it looks like is when you, when you look on the main screen, you can see every referral that's ever been placed for that patient, along with the status of that referral. So it's really easy for anyone to see what's happened with each referral. If we want to submit another referral for a family, we just click Assign Another Resource. And then the new window pops up and immediately starts searching the Lift Up KC database to find community agencies that can help the family within their geographic area where they live. So we can search by category of need, or we can search directly by the um, agency's name if we, if we know it. So then we can find which organization we wanna submit the referral to, click apply, and the new window pops up. We will insert the family's contact information 
that defaults in, or but we can always change it, defaults from P360. Uh, we then indicate the best way to reach out to the patient, click that we have consent to share contact information with the CBO, and then we can refer them right there. That then triggers that to immediately show up in the CBO's queue that they then can start working. It also immediately puts that referral into that main screen on EndNote to show the referral that we just created. The status will be not updated immediately, but as soon as the CBO updates the status on their side, it reflects that in EndNote. So we always have the most up-to-date information about that referral. This is just a quote from one of our end users and one of our practices just about how the um, process within InNote is, is very easy. She really enjoys using it. She's able to uh, do her work in a really effective and efficient way, leveraging the tool within InNote. Now we know that the technology is just one piece of the puzzle, a very important piece of the puzzle in getting this work done, but it's just one piece. And another piece that's crucial is that we have to have good relationships with CBOs in order for any of this to work. Without the CBOs engaged, nothing can happen. And so when we first embarked on this journey, we um, tried to engage CBOs by hosting these webinars where we shared how great this work was that we were doing. We had this great technology and that they should just come and use it. And that failed miserably, as you can probably imagine. Nobody wanted to work with us because they told us that we didn't understand the work that they do. They were already at capacity. They had more clients than they had the funding to be able to help. And they really needed to see what was in it for them. What was the value for them to work with us? And so we went back to the drawing board and we realized that we needed to put some skin in the game and really create value for them. And so we were focused on creating funded partnerships with some key organizations that could help our families. And so what we did was we targeted a, uh, five different organizations. Each of them sit within, within one of the five major counties across the Kansas City metro area. And each of them helps families with a wide range of needs that they might have. Because we know that when a family tells us that they worry about being able to have enough food to feed their children, they probably have a wide range of financial needs. And so these organizations not only will provide that family with emergency food to get them through the week, but they'll also sit down with them, provide some case management, and try to help them really figure out why they can't afford that food. What do they really need to become sustainable on their own? And so they'll work with them and say, okay, do you need help finding a job? Do we need some skills training, resume building? Do you need childcare? And so they'll take it a step further and really try to help that family so that they don't have to continue to leverage that food pantry forever. Um, so we provided each organization with a lump sum of money to, to help them have the ability to engage with us. We sign contracts on a yearly basis. We give them that money up front and allow them to use it for whatever they want. So a challenge that CBOs often have is that all of their money is very um, strict on what they can use it for. And so this enabled them to have a little bit more freedom. Most of them use it for staff time, but some of them have used it to buy technology or put it toward their programmatic funds. In exchange for the money, they agree to accept referrals through the technology, respond to them in a timely manner, and meet with us monthly to just help us figure out how we can improve the program. Through the technology, we tag these five referral partners with a, a green um, check mark and it defaults all of these to the top so that when our users are, are looking for resources, these are the first ones they see and we train them to always refer to these first. And not only has this helped us create better partnerships with the community, but it's also really simplified the workflow for our clinicians. So out in the community, most of our practices sit in one county and 90% of their patients come from that county. And because these CBOs help with that wide range of needs, each practice only has to remember that one CBO that they partner with. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship and they're not wasting time sifting through lists, trying to figure out what the right organization is to refer them to. This has made all the difference. Our goal was that we'd be able to submit these referrals within a matter of minutes. And we're so proud to say we've been able to do that in about 30 seconds. So this is a quote from one of our providers. She talks about how she was pretty negative about having to do this in the first place because she didn't think it would be possible to add one more thing to her workflow. 
But she said that with Lift Up KC integrated into EndNote, the ease of the technology and the relationships we've built with CBOs, she's able to do this within 30 seconds. And it doesn't matter what she tells her patients to do about their diagnosis if they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And so the impact that we can make within 30 seconds is, is tremendous. So I just have a few stats to share. This is um, just a trend line of usage on the websites. So um, the orange line is our public site over time, and then the blue line is our, our staff site. Uh, this is a trend line of all the referrals that we've made over time. So since the beginning of the program, we've submitted over 4,500 referrals for patients and families. And on average, we submit about 346 per month. And just to give you an idea of the wide uh, range of different things we've been able to help families with, um, we've been able to help them get access to food, employment assistance, affordable medications like inhalers, furniture, diapers, clothing, shoes, utilities assistance, um, and, and rent back pay to ensure that families are housed, in addition to getting them into those family stability programs where they help them um, become sufficient on their own and find jobs and um, really level up their income so that they're able to not have to keep coming back to the organization. So now I'll pass it over to Luke to talk about behavioral health. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so as we've kind of you know stepped back and wanted to continue to innovate and really look at that uh, overall well-being, as Alex mentioned earlier, really looking at whole child health, we realized you know that we were really just addressing two legs of a three-legged stool, right? Where we have a tremendous focus on medical and physical health. We now have these relationships in place with our community-based organizations, and we actually got exposure to one of our colleagues in Cincinnati where they were taking a very innovative approach to extending their network to include behavioral health entities. And so we stepped back and just a few months ago, we you know, embarked on this uh, to include them uh, in, in, this, uh, in this initiative. And so this is just really outlining that and really, you know, it, 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 something that we learned that was very unique is as we started these relationships, we thought these behavioral health entities wouldn't have any exposure to value-based agreements. In fact, the entities that we targeted, they're actually participating in value-based agreements. And now we're coming together to see how we can help um, each other perform better within these uh, agreements. And if, if we break it down, uh, the value proposition, it's really kind of two main components. One is on care collaboration, really around relationships. As Michelle mentioned earlier, it's really establishing that trust. These are relationships that didn't necessarily exist in a very effective way. And it's gonna focus on, you know, how do we connect patients to uh, better care and transition them from one acuity level to another, whether that's you know in the hospital to outpatient or even from an outpatient behavioral health setting into uh, primary care, where some of our practices are now integrating behavioral health services into their practice. And then the operational value piece, this is really around data and analytics uh, and giving them access to solutions that they don't have access to. And I'll talk about that over the next couple of slides. And that's, you know, this is this is just kind of stepping back and really looking at how do we democratize the information to these behavioral health entities? You, 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 it's hard to imagine just how cut off they are. They're not treated like a normal medical provider in our community. These behavioral health entities, they don't even have access to our Cerner EMR like our pediatric primary care practices do. As part of this partnership, we're breaking down that access to the EMR, and then we're also giving them access to Innovacer to help support our uh, collaboration and coordination. And then just advance it. So this uh, looks like a complex slide, but I did want to just kind of bring some reality as to what we're exactly doing from a data exchange and how Innovacer has stepped up to make this a reality for us. And so on the far left, we have the behavioral health entities. Uh, really to be conservative in terms of sharing and exchanging behavioral health data, we are only having them tell us who their active patients are, okay? So, and it's all patients regardless of, of what agreement, and they're telling us what type of services um, they're receiving as, as stated in the lower left. 
They're sharing that patient roster with us. We're identifying and matching those patients to identify where there's crossover. And then we're giving them direct access to these tools that they haven't had access to. Again, Cerner from a Children's Mercy perspective and then Innovacer from a broader perspective, um, you know, with all of our uh, practices in the community. As you can see on the on the right, it really opens up some of this awareness that they just didn't have before. So if there's an inpatient social worker, this patient was admitted, they're now seeing that, that a relationship exists with that behavioral health entity. I'm going to work with them. I'm going to coordinate the follow-up care after their discharge. Or down on the bottom, now there's awareness uh, from the behavioral health entity that they didn't know that they were admitted uh, to the ED. Next slide. And then this is, you know, I, I think Michelle's already outlined this, uh, but it's really reiterating the value and the information that this can bring to our behavioral health entities, both at the point of care. We're going to take the same approach where they would have access to be able to, you know, navigate that um, agnostic of their solution of record, and then also being able to access that full comprehensive longitudinal record to see care gaps. They don't even know who the primary care provider is uh, and be able to have uh, all of that context at their disposal. And so just last uh, slide here is, I do think it's important, like we're stepping back and, you know, we are putting some requirements on the behavioral health entities, but we're also putting forth an incentive, uh, kind of similar to what we do with our community-based organizations. The incentive here though is really focused on the engagement with us as a network. So we, we co-develop strategies for improvement, um, they have to participate in our, our committee governance structure and then move ahead and advance the data exchange as well as operationalizing these capabilities uh, for, for, for them. And then the long-term value, as you can see, is really around improving access, increasing that coordination, and ultimately reducing the total cost of care and, and success collectively in each of our own value-based agreements. And then you can see uh, where we're at in terms of actually getting the infrastructure and launching this work in, in full force uh, in 2024. Thank you, Luke uh, and Michelle. That was, again, an, a very comprehensive overview. And I yet it is just one set of initiatives um, that you're working on. Alex, do you have any uh, comments when you look at what they're doing and um, in this work? Uh, magnificent amounts of admiration. And, and gratitude that I get to, to listen and, and see the presentation. So please know, Michelle and Luke, it, as always, how impressive the work is. Curious, um, two, two questions. The first one is more mechanics and, and, and I guess legal in that way. Is, is the process you get the behavioral health facilities to join your CIN as a quality entity, which allows you to receive the full rosters legally, you know, or, or from a privacy, and then, you engage them around the value populations, which are a subpopulation, so that you can you can build the incentive models. How how does that is that kind of how that worked or? Yeah, we're we're approaching it. You know, um, we're, we are treating substance abuse in part two completely independent, so they're not sending us any patients related to that. So that was kind of a big caveat. I bring that up just in terms of getting okay. the legal, you know, structure in place. But then their sending and, and transferring of us of data really does fall within HIPAA from a healthcare operations perspective for those patients. Okay, and obviously you have to consult your own legal counsel. I'm not giving any any legal advice, and then. You know, in terms of their engagement and really the way that we do this on the clinically integrated network side is we look at it in terms of requirements that are for all patients, even like our participation in our network has some broad uh, requirements that are not exclusive to those value based patients. Now, of course, once we're part of a network and we're kind of collaborating, we're going to focus certain tactics or resources tied to those you know, specific patients and we anticipate that that incentive will evolve to be more outcomes oriented. But right now, because it's really focused on engagement, it's not necessarily tied to specific patients within particular value-based agreements, right? I don't know if, if that answers, if that answers that, your question. It, it doesn't, you need to start with a superset to get to match to the specific set. Um, they would not know which of their members are under a value agreement. So the, it's, it, that's where I was asking the order, and that, that did help me quite a bit. Um, likewise, our clinically integrated network, it integrated around 
quality. And so it's all patients from the members as a starting point, and then we focus tactically on specific value arrangements. Um, my second question, we all get asked, what's the ROI, right? That, that is um, immediately when, when, when we go uh, trying to get money or, or trying to justify the implementation of a system that takes resources, right? You mentioned, um, Michelle, in the, in the context of um, the, the SDOH uh, conversation, looking at, at outcomes. Can you, can you talk about an example of how you looked at a, um, a measure and said, this is how we studied the impact of being able to connect someone or a group of someone's to community resources and then compared um, those outcomes to when we did it, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's a question we get from leadership uh, constantly. So far, we've been able to get the funding to start the program really through patient stories. Um, and that's been compelling enough to leverage the funding that we've started in, in 2022. Now we are uh, kicking off a research study. We've got some researchers from the hospital engaged um, and we're gonna be looking at everything you're talking about. So we're gonna be looking at our screening data and seeing the, fam the people that screen positive and then following them forward to see who got referrals and who ended up getting help, who got, you know, didn't get referrals at all, who got referrals and weren't eligible so they didn't get help. And then what does that look like um, as we follow them forward to look at everything from utilization to clinical markers to immunization rates, our different HEDIS measures. So we're going to be looking at all of that. Um, we're just not quite there. I don't have any results to share yet, but we're embarking on that journey now. Well, I look forward to, to hearing and, and we're, we're in, the same, in the same boat. It's, it's following the journey and picking what it is we want to examine and um, what then deciding what it is we can say the activity did or did not do. Um, but um, luckily, we all have amazing researchers who can help us frame, frame that work. And both of both entities are building your program, sitting on data, you know, and sitting in automated workflows that are going to get you in a much better position to be able to capture um, as you look at individual and aggregated outcomes. Well, I know our listeners and viewers from today are certainly going to have a lot to think about um, as a long term health system executive and president of a large CIN. I can tell you this is heartening to see the type of advancements that are being made to really get specific in ways that lift up the peds populations in our communities. Because in fact, as you know, as you said with your one stat, Michelle, you take care of 50% of all children in an entire area. Um, they're counting on us. I know Nemours similarly is such an anchor in the communities you serve. And to think about the ways that you're now bringing new tools to bear uh, that let you scale and change the outcomes in ways you never could before. It's exciting to see your creativity, your persistence, um, and most of all, your leadership. Thank you all. We appreciate those that listened in today, and we look forward to having you join us again in another virtual webinar. Thank you.